When you talk about a law, you have to think of how relevant it is. Do you really need a law to say, don't kill another person, an innocent person? You don't. If you only need that, you're a psychopath. If you're a normal person, you know in your heart, you don't do that. Do you need a law to tell you not to steal another person's things? You know, if they're poor and they don't have anything. You don't need laws for that if your your soul is right. The only people that need laws like that are governments and corporations. Because then they can change and legally steal from you. Because they put the idea in your head that there's no such thing as human decency. Everything is a bit of a result of a piece of paper. And that's the wrong way. The fascia, the axe head, outside the sticks, the symbol of fascism. And you ever notice how tight those sticks are held? And the law will kill you. It will kill you with the law. And that's why all the Roman legions, when they marched into the new territories, first thing they carried out to the new land, Convert land was the fascia. The law of Rome, bound in sticks, meaning it will never be removed with an axe head on the top that it will be enforced by tyranny. That's very deep when you think about that, very deep. Could you imagine, when I'm explaining that to you, you're going, well, that's, you might, your action might be, oh, that's nonsense, or it's oh, well, that's very interesting, or wow. But could you imagine to people, indigenous European people, who had never known what laws were, who did business, took care of things out of human decency, did the right thing, then suddenly being told these things, it would have been catastrophic in their minds. Their whole world would have been turned upside down. You were telling them that black was white and white was black and left was right and left, right was left. That's how traumatic it was. And then you're telling them that, and if you don't believe it, we'll cut your head off. Now, perception management, the idea of making you think and believe certain things, is always happy because it's based on you telling you enough times is basically Pavlovian conditioning. Pavlov was the famous Russian scientist who discovered that if he trained the dog to eat according to ringing a bell, that eventually the dog would salivate just by ringing the bell, even if there was no meat. The dog would learn how, like just to train a pigeon to press a button to get a food pelt. Pavlovian conditioning, he discovered that animals, he didn't discover you, but animals could be trained by a reward system, and he scientifically put, pinned it down. And then a guy called Watson in America, a little later on, experimenting on his own child, believe it or not, just said the same, that human beings were just conditioned responses. Human beings had no souls, they were stupid robots. And they just, all they had to do was that they were told. I gave them a reward when you want them to do something, and punish them when they do something bad, and that's all you have to do to control humans. And you had Stanley Milcom's famous experiment where he put students in, in, a, in a school and he hooked them up to a machine and he told them on the other side of the machine is a man. And every time you turn up the knob on the machine, the dial, you'll get hit with extra voltage. And the guy on the other side wasn't hooked up, of course, he was just pretending. And they put all these people in there and as they turned up the machine, the, the man guy in the back would go, ah, stop. And then the, 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 the authority figure, the man in the white coat, the man in the white coat with a sheet of paper and a clipboard and a pen, go to a hundred volts. Many of them did without even having a question about it. The authority, the guy with the law, says, I must turn the machine up. Ah, on the other side of the room. The guy was acting, of course. Some people, some people said, I'm, I, I'm not doing this. If this man dies, is it my fault? And the guy with the white coat says, no, it's not your fault. We will take responsibility. Not one single person refused to kill the guy on the other side. Not one. Why? Because they had the authority figure, the college professor, with his PhD, clipboard looking all official and he's and he is saying not one and they and in every case they murdered him but they didn't murder him it was an actor and the ones who were only hesitant were only hesitant not because 
of a moral or a compassion reason, but because they wanted to make sure they didn't go to jail if they killed the guy. What they also discovered was, and this is very profound, that the more educated, academically educated the subjects were, the more likely they were to kill the person without question. If they were PhD level, they'd kill them without question. If they were someone from high school, they would be hesitant. That they're more mind controlled by the system through reward, examinations, and that kind of thing. Law, authority figures, obedience, reward, and all. So by the, this is why when the CIA, CIA, CIA were creating in the 1960s, they wanted to create a flying saucer cults, groups that they could use to have people worshipping aliens on other planets. There's two reasons for this. It's now all come out. It's a phenomenal documentary came out recently that shows that they wanted to invent the belief in aliens visiting Earth in certain places around America in particular so they could hide secret projects special aircraft, new rockets. And how do you do that? You tell them, well, it's not a new, nu a new nuclear bomb or a, a new special aircraft. It's alien visitors from another planet. You create these cults that they think they're in contact with the aliens, whether they're, they've got someone channeling, whether they've got someone communicating with aliens through a Ouija board or through something, through a crystal. And they would, they, would, they would set up these cult leaders off with big money to set up these cults. And what they found ever since, there's been several books written on this, that the more higher educated the person was, the more likely they were to believe that they were in contact with space aliens because they had been so mind controlled through their university control, the college thing, that they could never qu not question an authority figure. So the cult leader was telling them, I am, in, I am your king and I'm in communication with Zortok from Planet 7. And they would believe him because he was their leader. So it's, that's the black, the two parts of the spell. One is the law and the other is the authority figure, the king, the god, the same thing. If we didn't have a if we if we in the West didn't have a belief in a supreme god, we wouldn't have cult leaders. We wouldn't have Jim Jones, we wouldn't have people like that. Because people would be more individually inclined. I'm not doing what he says, who gave him authority? But we've been all been brought up to believe the god, the king, the general, the, the professor. The church leader, the guru, and that's why we're, that's why we're so easily controlled. Now, and so perception management is what that leads to. It makes you believe in things that are not real because you think, well, it's, it comes from the highest authority. It has to be true. Television news doesn't lie to me. Would Hollywood lie to me? What would Hollywood lie? Why would the Pope lie? Why would the president lie? Why would the why would these people lie? They're the, they're they're in the positions of power because they're the nicest guys in the world. All you have to do is have a look at how wonderful the world is to prove that they're the nicest guys in the world. And that's what Hollywood's job was. Hollywood is really the, the Rome of, of America. It creates perception management. It tells all Americans they're the freest people in the world that are not, not even close. It tells all Americans that the Indians were not, it was not a genocide. It just, it just was a mess. It went wrong. But we didn't, we didn't wipe them out the same way. You know, the Nazis wiped out the Jews, or the, the Stalin wiped out the, the Ukrainians. It wasn't genocide. It was genocide. But they tell them it wasn't, because why? John Wayne wouldn't commit genocide. The cowboys don't commit genocide. They're the good guys. They ride it at the end, and they save the girl, and they save they ride off to the sunset. And that's perception management, propaganda. And that was what Hollywood's purpose was, to create a mythology of Americans that believe in themselves, that they were always wonderful people. And America would never do anything bad. When we, when, we, our, you know, when we invaded Europe, the free Europe, it was always good stuff. We never did anything bad. We were Greek, we were good guys. Perception management. And, and they, they took over the Roman system of oh, this whole idea. Now, if you look at, like, you look, okay, here's an example. You want to talk about law? What is the number one TV shows in America always about? Doctors and lawyers. All the drama shows, LA Law, you know, a &E, you know, always cash at Rome. It's always. Attractive, sexy doctors and attractive, sexy lawyers. Ali Mac, you know, just go back, go, go right back to the 60s. Always doctors and lawyers. Doctor, every single top American show, doctors and lawyers, doctors and lawyers. So, they're, 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 they're the princes and the gods and the priests of the day. Do you see how they, they, they play on their heads? How could, how could a lawyer be bad? George Clooney is a lawyer. He's really good looking. 
He's a really nice guy, he's a famous actor. How could he be? You know, Angelina Jolie, she's, she's really pretty, she couldn't be a bad person, she played all the way that, that you think you laugh at that stuff and you say they're only actors. But that stuff gets into your head. And you start to believe it to the point where our parents are very happy when my, my daughter's going to law school, she's going to be just like, you know, so and so on some American TV show. Ali uh, might be. Now, so, uh, when I was a kid, I remember this film came out of the Light King with Kirk Douglas. It's a fa it was fantastic. I mean, when I was a kid, that was, these films are great with action, ships, fighting, you know, all the stuff you love when you're a kid. Fantastic. But it's all nonsense because it just shows the Vikings as the same uh, killers. They pick up the women, they go into the towns in England and they pick up the women and the women's legs are wiggling as they take them on. They say, let me go, I'm being pillaged, you know, that kind of thing. And, uh, but they have a very good scene in it that really stuck with me as a kid where they showed the witch, the Sather, the, the Viking witch, the sorceress, conjuring up Thor in the storm. And I remember thinking, oh, that's pretty cool, what's that all about? And then I, to, I go to find out who Thor, Thor is. And guess what? He's a comic book character in Marvel. He's nothing to do with the Vikings. You know what I'm saying? Like they take over everything and they use it for themselves. He's no different than Batman, you know? So they corrupt everything, Hollywood. And so nothing has changed. And now you have the new TV series that's made in Ireland. Don't talk to me about it. The Vikings. And it's, it's, it's a good show. It's really good entertainment. Just like that old film is good entertainment. But it still shows them as, as just crazies. You know, they're still, it's just, fight that this, it, it doesn't go to any deep level so after you know we're still got this crude stereotype that they're like serial killers you know it's still it's great entertainment it's fun on that level just like gangster movies are fun in their own kind of way they're interesting just like video games are interesting but unfortunately this is what people most people come to believe now you know the enduring symbol of the viking is the the horned helmet the helmet with the two horns coming out of it Never existed, ever. Not one has ever been found. That was made up by Christian propagandists. Who else has the horns on his head? The devil. <laughs> Baphomet, Lucifer, <laughs> Mistopheles. They did that with other groups too. They said the Jews had horns under their heads and that's why they wore the Yomica in the Middle Ages. And they, that's why the Michelangelo's famous statue of Moses is two horns on his head. They did that back then, they did it to other groups. You compare it to the devil. The Celtic god Pan is the devil. You look at him, he has the horns, he's the goat head. Baphomet is, and so on. And so the Vikings, they had to make devils of them real quick. What do they look like? They, wear, they have two horns sticking out of their head. Oh, they're bad, they're bad. They're on the other guy's team. They were, were worried. So all over Europe in no time, People were hearing about, you know, I heard this bunch of guys from Scandinavia called the Vikings, and they come in, they kill everybody, and they rob everything, and they have horns just like the devil. Just like the devil, because they are devils. They're on the side of the devil. They don't believe in God. They don't believe in Roman law. Now, you just think of the practicalities of that. that. Imagine you were wearing that helmet with the two horns coming out of it, and you had to run through a forest, <laughs> catching on every branch. You know? Makes no sense. These were highly educated, intelligent, uh, intuitive people. They wouldn't have worn a silly hat like that. <laughs> that was invented by the Franks, the Romans. They portrayed them as devils. And there's the devil there, and there's the, from much later, Elizabeth, much later, uh, Elizabethan era thing of a, a man being blessed by the devil, a group of satanic devil worshippers. But that's where it came from. The Viking helmet has never existed. The one, the two horns. The helmet they wore was just like a regular metal thing. Covered the eyes. Great in a fight. Your eyes are safe. Your head is safe. It's, it's pointy. Like your man. It's pointy on top. So the sword hits. It slides down. If you had two horns on it, it would just catch it and snap your neck off. And that's where that helmet came from. Now, in... October 782, Charlemagne, who was the emperor, the Roman emperor of the West, he had a mandate from Rome to be the emperor of the West. After the, his, main, his main job, his brief, shall we say, was to make sure that everybody in the West of Europe was to become Christian and Christians. There was to be no heathens left. Heathen is actually a lovely word. You know when you say, when you hear a Christian saying heathen, he's a heathen. All heathen means is a family who gathers around the fire together. That's all it means. 
it's, it's a lovely term. The heart of the heathen, the heart of the fire. That's all it means. It has not, and they, they made that, they made that a, a wicked word. But, uh, so his job was to kill them all. Now, the, the, only, the, 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 the Irish and the Brit English had already become Christian by that stage. How Ireland became Christian is very interesting. A guy called St. Patrick arrived in Ireland. A real person this guy was. And we were told he was an innocent shepherd boy who the, who the Irish captured as a slave from Britain and brought him over and he taught all these Irish the, the ways of God and the ways of Christ and the ways of the Bible and they all said, well, that's a great idea. Let's, let's do it. Good. Nothing of the sort. St. Patrick was the Henry Kissinger of his day. He was the, the Hillary Clinton of his day. He was a top level Roman diplomat who came to Ireland with a huge amount of money and he went up to the local chieftains and said to them, I've got business deals for you, convert to Christianity and we'll do lots of business with Rome. The usual thing, the ones that's hot. Uh, and there's a, there's a the legend in Ireland is that when he converted Ireland to Christianity, he drove the snakes away. This is the whole thing that St. Patrick sent the snakes out of Ireland. Ireland never had snakes, they never existed in Ireland. Snakes was a metaphor for the Druids, for the, the priest class of the Gaelic Celtic people, the Druid priests. He didn't drive them out of Ireland. He had them all murdered in a ritual sacrifice in Loch Erne, all drowned on the same day. Just like a couple of hundred years later, previous, in Anglesey in Wales, the last of the British Druids were massacred by Suetonius Polonus under the Roman law. Patrick actually means patrician in Welsh. He was a Roman bureaucrat. But they made the story perception management. He was a simple little shepherd boy who, you know, he just was so nice that everyone loved him so much that we all became Christians. The whole country. Perception management, nonsense. But anyway, that's how we, we were already Christian by that stage. And St. Patrick had also done some, done some converting in England. And that's like the big, the big centre of Glastonbury in England. St. Patrick's church is there. He founded that. So he started in Ireland, worked his way to England. And so the only parts of, of, of Europe left that were still not Christian was the Saxon world, Germany, Denmark, a bit of Holland bit over into uh, northern Poland, that area, and uh, Scandinavia, which was Vikings. And basically they shared a similar kind of Nordic religion. The gods were the same, Odin, Wotan, Woden, Dunar, Thunar, Thor, all the same. Similar, very, they're all basically the same. Polytheistic, meaning multiple gods and goddesses. And so, after, uh, uh, after Charlemagne's Hedons, had the massacre of, of four or five thousand five hundred prisoners, Saxon prisoners near Denmark, executed after they surrendered. He had them executed after they surrendered. Uh, he deliberately did that. That was a warning to be sent out to, to Scand Scandinavia, saying, I played hard, and you guys are next. You guys are next. If you don't play ball, if you don't become Christian and start paying your taxes to Rome, you guys are next. So this, uh, this spread all through Scandinavia sent a shockwave. You mean Charlemagne just killed 4,500 because they weren't Christians? Really? Yeah. He'll do the same here. He'll do, when he comes here, he'll do the same here. Obviously, this guy's crazy. Okay? So the Vikings have taken heed of the warning. Now, something amazing happened. I don't know if you know the work of Carl Jung, the Swiss psychologist, and his idea of the collective unconscious, that groups of people are wired together at a certain level. So when this news reached the Scandinavian regions, where these people, these Nordic people, Norse people were, they all did the same thing instinctually. It was the most amazing thing. They started building ships. And remember, these were often disconnected tribes. They were not all, there wasn't one big Scandinavian Viking empire. The ones in Sweden, although they had the same culture, were not in communication with the ones in Denmark, the ones in, they were all, they were all their own agendas going on. They were just roughly culturally the same, which shows the power of culture. You think about that? And uh, so instead of freaking out and going, oh my God, Charlemagne and, this, and the Franks are going to come and wipe, the Carolingian Empire is going to come and wipe us all out under the name of Rome, instead of that happening, instead of that happening, they started to get a bit smart. These were like the guys today who were like what you call the free men, these guys who were saying, I'm jumping out of the law. This is so very similar, it happened on a mass level now. It's very difficult to do that today, but back then they had 
there was a lot, a lot more people who were in immediate danger nowadays. They don't kill you so much, you just get out. So I, back then it was different. It was like that. And so they started building ships. And literally, that's what the records tell you. They said, we're in, we're in serious trouble here. We're in serious, serious trouble. This guy has the might of power of Rome. We wouldn't stand a chance if they invaded. We live on a, in Scandinavia, a huge peninsula. It's covered in mountains. There's not the best farmland in the world, not to support a big empire like they have. We don't have we're not like Italy or Spain where we can grow a vast amounts of food. Uh, what do we do? What do we do? And what they did was they started building ships and they said they can catch us on the land, but they can't catch us at sea. They actually changed their consciousness. You understand? Instead of saying, you know, all we've got to do is we've got to build a wall here and start training our soldiers to fight, like get ready when they come, they wouldn't have stood a chance. They wouldn't have stood a chance. They got smart. They said, we're going to become like gypsies on the oceans. And that'll serve two purposes. We can attack them from the sea because we have, we'll build long ships that are so fast and so strong and so powerful that they can't catch us, their ships are crap. And secondly, we can build up an economy that's not based on farming because prior to this, they were all farmers. They grew vegetables and fruit and they do the usual farming things, right? Cattle, sheep. We'll go on to see us and, we'll, and then we'll build, a, we'll build a massive economy. Now, no one sat down and, and thought about this. It happened all together at the same time. It was because when an idea is right, people know it's right. They instinctually feel, ah, does that make sense? Let's do it. They just know. They don't, have, they don't have to have a book telling them how to do it. They just know. And so that's what happened. And that's one of the most amazing transformations that ever happened in human history. Hundreds of thousands of people said, no. We're not going to lay down like dogs and be slaughtered. We're not going to lay down like lambs and be slaughtered. We're going to find another way. And we're going to make it hard for them. And we're going to, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to outsmart them. So that was because, and that, this is my, my absolute conclusion, that the reason why they believed, well, they were able to do this is because they were not Christians. Because they were not waiting for a boss to tell them to do it. They were not waiting for the law, the lawman to come into town and says the new law is we're building ships and going to sea. Because they had a complex indigenous spiritual tradition of many gods and many archetypes and many ways of looking at their own lives in this way. And also seeing themselves as not sheep under the flock of God but as the, the as living beings on this planet who were in communication and part of gods were part of them, they were part of the gods. There was no boss man telling them what to do. So what they did was they did something that, that human beings, I believe, if we could get back to this, get rid of the idea of the boss man, the official, the, the leader, we would all be like this again. Our lives would be so... Because you see, you, if you're in a relationship with a person who's domineering and dysfunctional, well, it's never going to get better. A junkie, a, 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 a drug addict never gets better by scoring more drugs. They only get better by saying, I'm going clean. I'm not going to, I'm not going to take drug heroin or cocaine anymore. I'm going to give it alcohol. That's the only way to get better. Same thing with a dysfunctional relationship. If you have a guy who's saying, if you have an abusive father and he's doing this to the kids, clean the floor, smack. The kid cleans the floor. Do you think he's not going to smack him when he wants him to say, wash the car? He's going to get two smacks. You understand? Two smacks, right? That's the law. Mow the lawn. Three smacks. Get a degree. Four smacks. That's the kid is trained Pavlovian conditioning. Different. That's, that's, that's how the... And where is the... So the only way that kid is ever going to say, please his father, his abusive father, is by running away from home. He's not going to go by going, one day he'll stop slapping me. One day it'll be good. And if I do everything I say, I'll make him real proud of me. And he won't slap me anymore. And he never thinks to himself, I should be allowed him to slap me in the first place. But if he says, enough, and leaves home, who's daddy going to slap then? I saw a play 
called Checkmates. It was about 20 years ago in, 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 uh, on Broadway. It was by a guy, and it was started, you know, the American actor Denzel Washington. It was when he was just starting out to become a big star. And the play was about a young, a young black guy in America who was really angry. He was really angry. And he was successful. He was a successful business guy. Uh, but he was complaining, the white man's doing this, the white man's doing that. And there was an older black guy who had actually grown up at a time where, in America, where black people really were subject to, you know, they couldn't drink in the same water as white people, you know, like in, in Alabama, places like that, or ride the same bus. And he was cool with everything. He was laid back and easy going. And he said, and the old guy goes, he says, I don't, and he says let me tell the difference between me and, you, me and you. I grew up really, really suffering for being a black man in the South. Look at all the opportunities you have. You have you had a white girlfriend. They would have hung me from a tree for doing that. You can go, you went to college, you, you're now making lots of money, and you're still angry. And he goes, I'll tell you why you're angry. Because, because what happened is, if you get a dog, and you put a rope around its neck, and put a stick in the middle of a field, that dog will run around on that rope, right? And the day comes that you take the stick away, you don't even need the stick anymore. Because he's been trained to run around in that, that thing. And he, just, and he says to Denzel Washington, that's what you are. You're the dog who hasn't, doesn't know that the stick is no longer in the ground. You still, your, your master is up here. And that's, 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 how, that's how the wrong law system works. But if you have never had that, if there's never been a central law, a central structure, a central God, a central power, well, then you're flexible. You're, 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 you just think about that. You know, you, you, you're open to doing things your own way. You're trying new ideas. Now, if they had been Christian, they would have never built the long ships. They would have never built the long ships, and they ne would have never discovered America. It would have never happened. Because they were waiting for the boss man to tell them. And the reason why is because they were not Christians, because they had Odin and Thor and Freya and Freya and Sid. They have all these gods and goddesses, which we'll talk about later, made them see themselves differently. They were not subjects, they were not victims. They were equal players with the world, the universe, the demons. I mean, it's all the play for, let's go. So that was the idea. But, but on top of building up their economic economy and infrastructure on the oceans for security to make it get money and all that kind of they wouldn't starve, but they did have to go into war. They could also raid Christian military outposts. And we're going to explain what they were.